This video is sponsored by Incogni. Now I know I speak for most people when I say that one of the biggest annoyances I encounter in my daily life is random phone calls from people I don't know. At least that's what I would have said before I started using Incogni. Did you know that countless companies are currently collecting and trading your personal information every day? And it might feel like there's nothing you can do about it. But that's not the case. What most people don't know is that you're allowed to make these companies delete your information. The only problem is it's kind of a long and confusing process and so many companies might have your information that it would take forever. But thankfully, you can use Incogni to do all the hard work for you. It can be used to get your personal information deleted, that way you don't have to jump through those hoops yourself. And it is insanely easy too. After just a few minutes of signing up, Incogni automatically started deleting my phone number wherever it was found. So if you want peace of mind too, you can head over to incogni.com slash cosmonaut and use code cosmonaut to get an exclusive offer of 60% off. Again, in case you missed it, that's incogni.com slash cosmonaut and use code cosmonaut, or you can click the link below and take your personal data off the market. Hi, this is Tommy Wesso, creator of The Room. Let me introduce you to the new Joker. All right, guys, I'm back, and I'm ready to finish reviewing all the Batman movies. If you didn't watch the first part, it's in the description. I mean, you don't have to watch it. I don't care what you do. I'm not your mom. Now, originally, I was going to split this series up into three parts, with two of them releasing in December and one in January. But I figured it would be more fun if we just cram everything into this second part. And that means we have a lot of movies to watch. So let's not waste any time. Let's talk about what people have been asking me to review for years. I've actually got something perfect for the occasion. I have in my hands a can of limited edition Dark Knight Rises Mountain Dew. This is called Dark Berry Dew. Now you guys may not know this, but I don't drink soda. I have not let this forbidden nectar touch my lips in many years. So I'm breaking my sobriety for you guys. Oh boy. It smells like poison cotton candy. This is a very disgusting aroma. This is an 11 year old can of Mountain Dew. So, uh, bottoms up. Oh! So this is the moment. This is when Batman movies stopped goofing around. This is where shit gets serious. Christopher Nolan was tasked with doing something that had never been done before. Make a Batman movie that plays it straight. A Batman movie that grounds the character in realism. That places him not in a fantastical fairy tale land, but in our world. This movie wants to make Batman hardcore again. Now I've said a few times before that I am a certified Christopher Nolan naysayer. I think he's just a little bit overhyped a lot of the time, but I've never really elaborated on why I feel that way. Now don't get me wrong, the guy makes good movies, I can't deny that. I would say that I enjoy most of his films, but sometimes I have a big problem with his style. The thing is most of the time, I don't think Nolan has the sauce. You know what I mean? Like his style is very clinical, very safe. In most of his movies, I am not wowed by his directing or writing. Nine times out of 10, I am enjoying myself when watching his films, but rarely am I ever amazed. I would say that I have none of these complaints when it comes to Oppenheimer. I think that is his best movie by far. That's a movie that has the sauce. But that's not the case with most of his movies. A lot of his films have stuff that stops me from loving them. The Prestige has a very cool plot, but the twist is something so obvious that when it's revealed at the end, it feels kind of anticlimactic. Interstellar is so fucking good until it gets goofy and Matthew McConaughey gets sucked into an interdimensional bookshelf. Tenet has a really cool premise, but it's bogged down by a script that is so stupid, it's kind of hilarious. I realized I wasn't working for you. We've both been working for me. I'm the protagonist. And he's not joking. That's his name. And the Dark Knight trilogy is so thrilling, so tense, and then it just can't manage to stick the landing. So yeah, while I like Nolan's movies, I'm usually left wanting more from them. But while I've seen these Nolan Batman films quite a few times, I've never watched them one after the other. I've never marathoned them like this. So this time we're gonna try to see if the Nolan trilogy is truly as good as we remember. Now I can say early on that this is a very cool first shot. 
And in fact, I like how the first shot of each movie in the trilogy is the same. This is pretty badass, and it sets a good identity for the trilogy in a simple way. This gives the trilogy 10% sauce. This film starts with a young, misguided Bruce Wayne living abroad when he's confronted by Qui-Gon Jinn, who invites him to learn how to be a ninja. Now, I think it's very funny that this guy starts the movie by saying, uh, hey, yeah, my boss is Ra's al Ghul. He wants you to come join us at ninja school. And I'm like, buddy, you look just like Ra's al Ghul. Wait, I'm sorry, I mean Ra's al Ghul. Mr. Raz al Ghul? You know, I don't like that. That just doesn't feel right. Raish, not Raz. A common mistake. This film takes a significant amount of time to show us Bruce's backstory, ranging from his childhood to him training to be Batman. And with how much Nolan likes using the concept of time in his stories, it makes sense that he would structure his Batman backstory film like this. And this is probably the final time we'll ever get a movie that bothers to do this. We might get a flashback here and there, but for the most part, we are never gonna get a movie that's solely about Batman's backstory. And thankfully, instead of drip feeding this story to us like Batman 89 did, this film focuses on the mythology and the motivations of the character a little more. This version of Bruce is much more fleshed out and we really understand why he would decide to become Batman. It makes perfect sense for this character. And I do like that this narrative focuses on certain aspects that people usually ignore when it comes to his backstory. His fixation on bats, his outlook on crime as a whole, the sheer scope of the influence of his parents, and other details of that fateful night on Crime Alley. Like the show that he and his parents saw and how he reacted to it. So many Batman adaptations ignore the fact that the thing he watched before his parents died should be very significant to him. Though I would like it better. If the movie had them watching Zorro, like in the comics, but it's fine, I get what you were going for, 5% less sauce. I also do like that fear is such a strong theme for this film. I like a good theme. Fear is one of the things that motivates Bruce to be Batman, and it makes sense that Scarecrow is the main villain in a story that has this theme. And I love that the climax is based around the whole city just going absolutely insane with fear. It also provides a good sense of scale, and it feels like a very Batman problem for him to solve. In general, I think I've found that I really enjoy when Gotham just gets absolutely fucked up. It's fun. I like it. But what I don't like are the fine details in this Batman narrative that makes it feel a little un-Batman-y. One thing I despise in Batman movies is when they tell us over and over again how bad Gotham is. But then when we see it, it doesn't really look that bad. This is one of the most annoying things in this trilogy because for the most part, Gotham looks fine. There's like one bad neighborhood, but honestly, I've still seen worse. It's a really big problem that Nolan has at times of telling over showing. In good Batman movies, we can see with our own eyes that Gotham is a shithole. And in this movie, the main villain's evil plan is to destroy Gotham because it just has too much crime. They're like, ah, Gotham is too far gone. It must be destroyed by our army of ninjas. Gotham's time has come. The city has become a breeding ground for suffering and injustice. It is beyond saving and must be allowed to die. Okay, man. It's really not that bad. Have you been to Baltimore? This is just one of Nolan's many flaws as a writer. He wants his movies to be serious Batman movies. But comic books by nature are goofy. In this situation, you just can't have your cake and eat it too. You have a man who looks like this running around with a goofy monster voice. You don't get to make a fully serious movie if that's happening. There's always goofy ass shit like this. You burned my house and left me for dead. Consider us even. Um, he saved you actually. He like went out of his way to do that. What are you, stupid? Normally I don't mind if a superhero movie is goofy. I praised previous Batman movies for being dumb comic book silliness but Nolan at times seems embarrassed to be making a comic book movie. Like he wants this shit to be taken seriously really badly. So when it has plot lines that feel like they're written for children, it stands out more. But of course that's something I'll get to in his later movies. Also, I can say that I don't think Katie Holmes really fits this movie. Her performance is a little too weeknight CW for my liking. She always has that fucking DreamWorks smirk. Her performance just doesn't really fit the tone that the series is going for. And it doesn't help that I also don't really like the character of Rachel. It feels like she was included to get the teens and young adults watching the movie. And while that's just a theory, I'm not really saying it out of nowhere. I of course have to bring up the infamous Batman Begins Nickelback commercial. I never stopped thinking about you. And when I heard you were back, I started to hope. Yes, this is real. 
I feel like it makes sense for her to be put in the first movie as a bit of a studio mandate, and then when the second one comes around and Nolan gets more control, she gets hit with the Oppenheimer special. Legalize nuclear bombs. I already have a strong distaste for Batman being in love with boring brunettes, and if you're gonna do a Batman romance subplot, you gotta do it really well for me to get behind it. And it's just not very good here. I hate that she has to be the voice of reason for things that Bruce should already know. Why can't Batman Begins be about Batman learning how to be Batman without his butler and his girlfriend and the villain having to teach him all the lessons that he should already know? But I don't want to make it seem like I hate this movie. These are just a few things that annoy me about it, and overall I think it is a very solid flick. Honestly, this movie has great performances from almost every side character. While Morgan Freeman is mostly playing to type, his character adds a lot of energy and dry humor to a trilogy that mostly plays everything straight. I like the relationship between him and Bruce a lot, with him being fully 100% aware that Bruce is Batman, but always refusing to say it outright. It's a very fun dynamic. Someone who's playing against type here is Gary Oldman, who usually plays villains who chew the scenery at every opportunity. But here he shines as the most straight man to ever straight man. We also have Tom Wilkinson, who's grossly underrated as Falcone. Sorry, wait. Falcone sent them to kill you. Falcone? That's not how you pronounce that. I can forgive Raz, but Falcone just sounds too goofy. Anyway, he's really good in the movie. In his first scene, he is so deliciously detestable that you immediately want Bruce to beat the shit out of him. That's just with one scene. That's how you leave an impact. And of course I have to mention Michael Caine as Alfred. This is without a doubt the best on-screen depiction of Alfred in any movie. At least for the first two movies, but I'll get to that later. I also think this movie's paced really well. I like that we don't jump immediately to Bruce being fully suited up. I like that he doesn't have his shit together right at the beginning. I like that he has to slowly get to that point. We don't really see Bruce fully gear up as Batman until the halfway point. And by that time, it doesn't feel like we had to wait an agonizing amount of time for the movie to get to the good part. It feels earned. The pace picks up a lot at this point too, and it leads to a very well-constructed narrative. And to Nolan's credit, this film is also very good at contextualizing Batman for the modern world. I'll criticize his apparent discomfort with making a superhero movie, but I have to admit, he's good at explaining every aspect of the character and making it make sense in our world. Bruce doesn't get his playboy persona automatically. He realizes, well, I have this crime-fighting thing down, but I really need a fucking alibi. And this leads to probably my favorite depiction of the Bruce Wayne persona in any live-action Batman movie. This film is called Batman Begins, and that's kind of exactly what it's about. It's everything that it says on the can. And for what it's worth, I think Batman himself is best portrayed in this movie. He's imposing, he's skilled, and he's actually really cool. I think this is the one movie where Bale's Batman really gets to shine as Batman. This film does a great job at taking the character and showing everybody why he can be taken seriously. And it's home to some of the best and most fitting one-liners for the character. I don't know. I swear to God. Swear to me! That line is so cool. And I'm sick of pretending that it's not. I think overall this story has some issues with balancing the supervillain goofiness with an otherwise serious tone. Pocket sand! But it doesn't stop it from being a good time. And it especially deserves points for paving the way for great Batman movies that follow. So 7 out of 10, pretty good movie. But now, it's time to get really serious. And here we go. About 90% of the time when I make these videos, I have to rewatch the movie that I'm talking about quite a few times so that I know exactly what I need to say. The only exception has been with A New Hope and now this movie. I do not need to rewatch The Dark Knight to know what I have to say about it. I mean, I still watch it anyway, how can I not? I have seen this movie countless times. I remember the day I saw it in theaters and it changed my whole personality. See, I've thought Batman is really cool my whole life, but in the same way that most people think Batman's cool, but this movie's what got me obsessed with Batman. After I saw it, I started devouring comic books. It's what truly got me to dive headfirst into the pages of DC and Marvel. And I was not the only one. I talk a lot about which superhero movies really started the whole superhero movie trend. And there's a lot of argument to be had on which movie really started things. But there's really only one answer for which movie reignited the superhero genre. There's no question, it's this one. In the era that this movie came out, superhero movies were seen as trash, lock, poo-poo garbage. 
This film put up all-star numbers. Batman flew into movie theaters across this nation and made box office history. The Dark Knight hosted the biggest opening weekend of all time. The world went absolutely insane for The Dark Knight. Everybody saw it. Everybody was talking about it. It was a big deal. You could take anybody to go see this movie because it is one of the single most thrilling crime films of all time. But maybe that's part of my problem with it. Now don't get me wrong, I love this movie. But my biggest issue is that while I think it's good, I don't think it's a very good superhero movie. I've always said that to me, The Dark Knight is an expertly crafted crime thriller that just so happens to have Batman in it. And that's the main reason it did so well. Anybody who thought superheroes were corny got to watch it and delude themselves into thinking they weren't watching a movie about the Batman. But if you love superheroes and you love the character and world of Batman, this story might be lacking in a few areas. Like, don't get me wrong, for the longest time, this was the definitive Batman movie. Because it was either this or one of these. So there wasn't much of a competition. But I think that since The Dark Knight, we've gotten so many amazing portrayals of Batman in movies and games and shows. Not you! And I should say that this is kind of the beginning of when Nolan's distaste for making a superhero movie starts to become more apparent. I wouldn't say that Batman's a side character in this movie, but his role is definitely diminished when you compare it to the one that he had in Batman Begins. Batman just really doesn't feel as cool in this one. He doesn't have a bat cave, the mystery solving is kind of simple. He really doesn't have a lot of scenes where he can really flex and be Batman, because a lot of the biggest moments in this film are just dominated by the Joker. This movie shows its intentions immediately. Instead of opening with a dark, steamy night of crime, we open to a bank heist in broad daylight. See, this isn't about Batman right now. This is about the Joker. The last movie ends with a tease to the character, showing us that Batman has inspired criminals to meet him at his level of theatrics. If fear was the main theme of the last movie, I'd say this one is a lot more about inspiration. Characters are constantly inspired by a force greater than themselves. Maybe this influence compels them to be a force of evil, or maybe they become inspired to do the right thing. But there's no question which one of these categories the Joker falls under. And this intro is the perfect introduction to this character. A character that has left such a massive impact on pop culture that it outshines everything else in the entire trilogy. Every Joker that has come after Ledger is forever cursed to be compared to him. The good and the bad. But what makes Ledger stand out is a factor that surprisingly few Jokers have. He's actually funny. You think you could steal from us and just walk away? Yeah. It's kind of crazy that this aspect of the character is almost never utilized. Most Joker performances take more of the vaudevillian, over-the-top showman angle. But Ledger's Joker kind of feels like a stand-up comedian who kills people. But not only that, he's so complex that most people who watched this movie missed out on the finer details of the character. Most audiences took his Agent of Chaos monologue literally when it was clearly a lie. This character is so good at lying and deceiving people that he deceived the fucking audience. Some people criticize this Joker for not being anything like the comic version of the character, but this Joker does retain some elements that I think are key to any version of the character, namely his pride. I think it's safe to say that across most renditions of the character, the Joker is a very prideful person. And the worst thing you can do is insult him or the strange code he may live by. One of my favorite portrayals of the Joker is from an episode of the animated series called Joker's Favor. In this episode, Joker's driving like a dick on the highway when some random guy retaliates and curses him out and calls him a motherfucker. Now, Joker doesn't really like this, but he doesn't just kill this guy. He simply says that if he wants to live, he now owes Joker a favor. And he doesn't need that favor done today or tomorrow, but one day he will. Now this guy gets justifiably freaked out. He grabs his wife and kids, he moves out of Gotham and he builds a new life in a new state. However, years later, Joker calls and he wants his favor. He forces this random nobody that flipped him off on the freeway years ago to take part in a suicide mission. And of course, Joker plans to kill him when he gets finished with the mission anyway. That's the kind of guy he is. If you even mildly inconvenience him, he will leave you agonizingly waiting for years, wondering when he's going to take his revenge, and then he'll kill you. That's not an agent of chaos. That's not a man without a plan. And I could totally see Heath Ledger's Joker doing some shit like that. 
In fact, Joker's entire plotline in this film revolves around his pride and his personal code. I love that in the scene where he's first talking to the mobsters, it's all fun and games at first, but then he gets really upset when he gets made fun of. It's among the few times we actually see him get mad. <laughs> You're crazy. I'm not. No, I'm not. This makes him so mad that he fakes his own death so he can sneak into this guy's house and stab him in the throat. In fact, this isn't the only time this happens in the movie. Why don't we cut you up into little pieces and feed you to your pooches? Hmm? If you call him weird, he just kills you. He has no tolerance for that. And I love that for the whole film, across all of his many plots and schemes, his only goal at the end of the day is to prove Batman wrong. And that is exactly what the Joker would do. It's very clear that this character and performance deeply inspired not only Nolan, but everybody else in the film, and the entire movie revolves around it. Now, what's honestly a shame is how little praise the other actors get in this film. Maggie Gyllenhaal is a significant upgrade to Katie Holmes, and she fits the tone of the story much better. I love that in this one scene, she was legitimately scared of how Heath Ledger looked, and she turned that real fear into a very convincing performance. Aaron Eckhart is so good in this movie that it's kind of unfair that he didn't become a superstar after this came out. He was amazing, and he still got outshined by Heath Ledger. Because really, this is the Joker movie, to the point where the narrative kind of takes a dip when Two-Face gets introduced. You see, while Eckhart's performance is great, I think the inclusion of Two-Face feels a little forced. Everything related to Two-Face kind of ignores all the logic that the film establishes up to this point. For a majority of the film, we're solely shown that Harvey Dent is a paragon of justice. At worst, he's incredibly naive, but he still has the city's best interests in mind. Even when you think he's taking things too far and he might kill one of the Joker's henchmen, we learn that he was never actually gonna do that. But then, his girlfriend gets blown up, he gets disfigured, and now he's crazy and evil and he wants to shoot children! I'm gonna kill you! I'm insane! I get that the point of this is to show that the Joker can be right if the circumstances allow for it, that a person as good as Harvey can be dragged down to this level, but it doesn't feel earned. I think one of the sloppiest scenes in the whole movie is the scene where Joker visits him in the hospital. The dialogue of this scene is really good, don't get me wrong, but it's really the outcome of this scene that's a little strange. Firstly, it's hilarious that Harvey didn't recognize the Joker until the Joker takes off his COVID mask. You know, maybe I was wrong about Cesar Romero's mask. I think that shit does work. Now, this is a man who freaked out on the polka dot man so he could protect Rachel, but when he is met face to face with Rachel's killer, he lets him go. Now, Joker can be a pretty persuasive guy, but again, this does not feel earned. It feels forced so that we can see Two-Face in the Batman movie. But I think that's probably the only dip in quality that I've noticed over my many times watching this film. And what makes this movie so good, in my opinion, is how it balances tension across the whole story. This movie has so many climaxes that it should feel disorienting, the pacing should feel completely off, but each set piece is better than the last, so it leaves the audience wanting more. It makes us desperate to see how this story is going to keep topping itself. I remember when I first saw this scene where Rachel dies and Batman loses, I thought the movie was going to be over, to be continued. And the sheer glee I felt when I realized that the real climax hasn't even happened yet, it was euphoric. In many ways, this film is kind of like the magic trick that Nolan attempted in The Prestige. He is very good at misdirecting the audience to pull out genuinely shocking twists. The intro is a good example of this misdirection with the faceless goon that we're following who's, oh my god, he's, he's the Joker! That was him the whole time! Wow! We might think that this movie has the balls to kill Commissioner Gordon. And then, it's okay, Gordon's alive! And then the main love interest dies anyway. And even then, every Bat fan in the theater thought that Rachel would live and Harvey's bomb would go off, scarring him for life and turning him into Two-Face. Nope. Both bombs go off. Fuck you. Don't try to predict what the magician's gonna do. It's rude. And what really ties all this together is the score. Between this film and Inception, Hans Zimmer really made his mark. I think my favorite part in the movie is how Batman beats the Joker. It's nothing crazy either. He just shoots his little wrist blades at him. But everything about this little moment shows what I love about this movie. We're shown the blades in the beginning of the film when Bruce gets his new Batman suit. That's it. That was two hours ago. We've forgotten he has those. But that's part of the magic trick. We were shown them once forever ago, and so much shit has happened along the way that we forgot they exist. 
It's a classic misdirection. And the fact that Bruce uses them as an answer to the line that Joker has used in his most intense scenes is so simple, yet so effective. You know how I got these scars? No, but I know how you got these. I just really appreciate when simple storytelling like this is used effectively. That's part of the magic trick. It doesn't have to be complex to be impressive. And really, it is magic that Nolan managed to make a movie with Batman and the Joker that's this good. Even if it has some minor flaws and it isn't exactly my favorite on-screen representation of Batman, I cannot deny that this movie rocks hard. It's one of the best comic book movies ever made, period. And I'd be a fool to say otherwise. Nine out of 10. The true, oh. Um, I don't like this movie that much. Sorry. It's actually quite disappointing because I think this isn't even a bad movie. It's competently shot, the performances are on the same level they've always been on, and while the story is pretty standard, it isn't bad. Though the editing can be absolutely awful at times. Tell them we'll think about it. Okay. I like your place. What the fuck was that? In fact, this is something that's in almost every one of Christopher Nolan's movies. Sometimes the editing can really create some very unintentionally funny moments. Look at me! Oh no! Jesus! What the fuck? The first scene alone has been memed so hard that I think I'm incapable of watching it with a straight face. For the entire run of Game of Thrones, I would refer to Littlefinger as CIA. I'm CIA. And the memes extend beyond the movie itself. If there's ever a comedic take on the Batman world, you can bet your ass that Bane is going to have the silly accent. We will be the Joker's reckoning. When you compare this scene to the opening scene of the previous movie, it really is a case of coughing baby versus hydrogen bomb. The line delivery and bad audio mixing make this feel like it's not even part of the same trilogy. Like, why did he leave the Bane voice sounding like this? Why is it so loud? Was getting caught part of your plan? Of course. This movie's going to be awful. And really, it's easy to say that this movie isn't as good as the previous one because it obviously isn't. It's very clear that Nolan's plan for the final film relied very heavily on Heath Ledger's Joker. And he was unfortunately left with nothing else to work with once it came time to finish the trilogy. And while I say that this isn't entirely his fault, there are aspects of this movie that I'm really just not a fan of. While I don't think it's a bad movie, I do think it's kind of a bad Batman movie. And if Christopher Nolan was embarrassed to be making Batman movies before, it is especially true here. Batman straight up feels like a side character in this one. This story focuses a lot on the cops, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character being a big focus. And he's not like a bad character. As a Robin, I like that his origins parallel other Robins, with him being an orphan and the fact that he deduces who Batman is. But the thing is, He's not Batman, I wanna watch a fucking Batman movie. And I think the ending of the previous film is amazing. With Batman taking the fall for Harvey, it parallels the end of Batman Begins where he has that one iconic line. I never said thank you. And you'll never have to. The raw selflessness of this version of Batman is his best trait. And uh, this movie immediately shits on that by having Batman retire the second he gets home. Yeah, after he rides off into the fucking night, he stops being Batman. And I really don't know why he did this. It could either be because he's sad about Rachel, which is not a good enough excuse, or because the Harvey Dent Act has eliminated organized crime, which is also not a good excuse. The only way this makes sense is if all crime in Gotham has been eliminated, which is so childish and stupid that it's literally a plot point in the baby Batman Christmas movie that just came out. And in that movie, it's played as a joke. That movie is pretty good though, and I'm not reviewing it because it's not a theatrical release, but it's cute, it has some good moments. Luke Wilson's Batman gets a B. Batman is not allowed to just fucking quit his job unless he has a really good reason. I think this might be the one Batman movie with the shortest amount of screen time for the Caped Crusader. It's even dumber because he comes out of retirement immediately once Bane appears. Like, that's all it took? One bad guy? You really want me to believe that in eight years, up until this point, there was seriously no crime. No reason for you to leave your house. Like why even have Batman be retired? The movie is probably more interesting if he's still being Batman, but in a more vigilante way. But weirdly enough, this trilogy is kind of anti-vigilante. But what you're doing has to be beyond that. It can't be personal or you're just vigilante. Uh, Christopher, 
You know you're making a Batman story, right? Alfred has also gone from being one of the best characters in the trilogy to being so insanely out of character that even back when I saw this movie for the first time, when I was a much less critical young man, I was still saying, yeah, I don't really like what they did with Alfred in that movie. Alfred is now very distinctly anti-Batman, which is strange because from the beginning, he had no reservations when Bruce reappeared after years abroad with a scheme to funnel millions of dollars into dressing up as a bat and punching people. He was on board for this, but now out of nowhere, he's like, but Master Wayne, this is all a bit silly, isn't it? I want you to settle down and get a wife. Like seriously, in this movie, he just really wants Bruce Wayne to get married for some reason. It's like a complete flip. All of a sudden, he is not fucking with this Batman shit anymore. And then in his worst moment, he abandons Bruce. They have an argument and he moves out. And I don't think I need to tell anybody here that Alfred would not do that. It does not matter if Bruce told him off or not. He would not leave unless he had a really good reason. I will say that this movie also features Anne Hathaway as Selena Kyle, and I do think that Anne Hathaway does put on a very good performance. She plays the femme fatale really well. She has a certain, you know, a certain something that makes her a very talented, a very talented actress. You know, maybe I do have a thing for Catwoman, but really the only complaint here is that her costume is a little goofy. It looks like a Halloween costume. It, it looks bad. Why, why did they do this to you, baby? Now, I praise the last movie for being a masterclass in tension and pacing, and this movie has none of that. Batman reappearing after his retirement should be something that brings weight and significance. Think back to how Batman is built up to in Batman Begins. That movie makes us earn it. He hasn't been Batman in eight years, and we have all the side characters telling us how fucking sick and awesome Batman is. And I swear, when it comes to show, don't tell, Nolan can really be a fucking hack fraud sometimes. It should not be hard to show me how cool Batman is without anybody having to tell me how cool he is. Boy, you are in for a show tonight, son. I'm gonna do what Jim Gordon never could. What's that? I'm gonna take down the Batman. Eight years. He has to pick tonight. Like a rat in a trap, gentlemen. Stop fucking talking! Yeah. Internalize! This is what happens when you are making a sauceless Batman movie. Zero percent sauce. This movie actually has a really bad time with conveying information without relying on out of place exposition. I think most of the script consists of exposition. Where is it? The clean slate, where you type in someone's name, date of birth, in a few minutes, they're gone from every database on Earth. Was there really no other way to convey that information to us? The pacing here is also not the best. This movie is the longest in the trilogy, and it definitely feels like it. The story feels very unsure of itself, with most of it relying on the goodwill of the previous film. The first half of the story is very aimless, and when the plot finally gets rolling, it goes back to the plot of the first movie and not the good parts of it. It reuses the stupid plot points that had to do with Ra's al Ghul. Bane and Talia's plan is to blow up Gotham with a nuclear bomb because they say it is too evil to exist. Hey Christopher, I thought all crime was eliminated. This should be the safest city in the world. Why do they still think it's evil? Innocent is a strong word to throw around Gotham, Bruce. Why do all of these random Europeans hate Gotham City this much? And you could say, oh, well, all that safety was built on a lie. I don't care if it's so safe that Batman doesn't even need to leave his fucking house, then the ninjas don't have to blow it up, all right? It's as simple as that. There are probably cities that are way more fucking evil that you could go blow up. Hell, just blow up Florida, all right? It deserves it. What's even more sauceless is the action scenes. Nolan is officially not trying anymore. Every action scene features a static camera aimed at stiff, lifeless combat. I'm not lying, I think it might be the worst action I've seen in a big budget superhero movie. And even beyond all this, the most distracting thing in this film is how much it loves cops. Usually when people say that superhero movies are copaganda, they're just saying shit. They don't really know what they're talking about. But this is the one case where it's actually true. Cops are the real heroes of this movie, not Batman. Robin is the secondary main character, and he's the best cop on the force. 
Part of the reason that Alfred has a falling out with Bruce is because he says, Oh, Master Wayne, you got in the way of all those cops who were doing their job. There's a subplot for most of the second half which revolves around a secret society of cops that are fighting the good fight against Bane and his terrorists. At the end of the movie, right before Batman straps the big fucking stupid bomb to his plane and kills himself, he says, Don't worry, Gordon. Gotham doesn't need Batman. It has cops like you. <laughs> And of course, Batman's plan to save Gotham involves a literal army of cops running at the villains. Like, look at this image. Do I need any more proof? My problems with this movie are things that really can't be fixed by just swapping Bane for the Joker. And to be fair, there are things I do like about this movie. I like Gordon's conflict in this narrative. I like that while Bruce is fine with taking the fall for Harvey, Gordon has hated being forced to stand up for the man that tried to kill him and his family. I like that Bane sends the Gothamites on stupid little side quests after he takes over the city, and overall I do like the No Man's Land plot in the second half. This is a section of the film where I'm fine with Batman being a little more absent. It's okay to make us miss Batman during these segments of the story. And I think that when he finally does return to Gotham after Bane takes over, it does feel a little more earned. But it is dulled by the fact that this is the second time in the movie that Batman has returned after being gone for a long time. I think this movie's just a little bit worse because of how strangely structured the first half of the story is. Overall though, I think the movie does improve a lot past the halfway mark. Not enough to make me love it, but enough to make it a watchable film. And I do kind of like the ending. I think all the characters get a decent resolution, but if I could change one little thing, like one little selfish change, I would like for this movie to not show us Bruce Wayne at the end. It's so much more subtle and effective if we just see Alfred look up at the camera and smile. Like we would get it. It would be the perfect ending. But what do I know? I'm not a screenwriter but at least I know it's pronounced Falcone. So yeah, it's not a bad movie. It's not one of the worst superhero movies ever made, but I personally am not really a fan. I think as a whole, it fails to be a satisfying follow-up to one of the best comic book movies ever made. And sometimes it really just doesn't feel like a Batman movie. There's like no atmosphere. Most of it takes place in broad daylight and it doesn't feel as heroic as it's trying to be. Call me old fashioned, but I like my Batman movies to have Batman in them. But props for having one of the funniest death scenes that an Oscar award winner has ever done. Five out of 10. But now let's judge Christian Bale's Batman. And we'll start with his Bruce Wayne. As I've said before, I think this is the best on-screen Bruce performance that we've gotten. I really love the scene where he has to save the people at his birthday party by pretending to be a drunk asshole. It's very much something that Bruce would do. And like I said, I think this is probably the most selfless version of Bruce Wayne. And I really like that. And there's really only one moment where I was mad about a choice he made. I truly, utterly despise that he was totally fine with shooting Joe Chill with a gun until Katie fucking Holmes tells him that shooting people is wrong. And then he's like, oh wait, my parents got killed by guns. I hate guns now. Like he should have come to that conclusion on his own, but that's not the worst thing ever. At least the no gun rule is actually a thing in this trilogy, so I kind of accept it. It's a roundabout way of showing it to us, but at least it's something. He also gets massive points for his playboy Bruce Wayne persona. I really like seeing how this Bruce deceives the public with a persona that's such a scumbag that nobody would ever think he's running around saving lives every night. It's a good Bruce Wayne. Thumbs up. I like him. Smile. But how is his Batman? Well, to start off, as I've said already, the action in these movies it's kind of bad. And to be fair to the trilogy, the films are not trying to focus on the action, but I mean, it just kind of makes things a little more disappointing. I know that Nolan can do a cool fight scene. He just doesn't feel like it half the time. Most of the time, the action is so awkward and stiff and the bad guys are just standing there patiently waiting for Batman to punch them. And I hate the way that he fights. He's just fucking swinging his arms around like Donkey Kong. <laughs> he never seems like an expert hand-to-hand -hand combatant. He looks like Miss Piggy when she's mad at somebody. It's like every fight scene is missing the sauce. <laughs> like in the first movie when Bruce has to fight his way out of ninja school, I thought he was gonna have to fight all the fucking ninjas. They even mention the fact that he has been trained to take on a whole army. And when he betrays Ra's al Ghul, I expected him to have to take all of them on, but no. The ninjas run away. These are the same ninjas that we've been shown are robotically loyal to their duty. These ninjas have been trained to show utter discipline and most importantly, they are notably without fear. 
But once Bruce blows up the attic, they're like, oh my God, the building's on fire. Everybody run for your lives. Now, yeah, I understand that me saying, hmm, I wanted Batman to fight all the bad guys and not just one of them. It's very much a personal preference. It doesn't make the movie any worse but it also doesn't make Batman any cooler. And it doesn't help that the rest of these fight scenes are just so badly choreographed. The final fight with Bane is honestly a joke. I don't know how anybody could be excited for this. And Batman's competence and coolness is very much a mixed bag in this trilogy. Batman starts off the trilogy being really fucking cool. He feels like a force of nature. He gets to make an impact in every scene he's in because that movie made us earn Batman. But then in The Dark Knight and then The Dark Knight Rises, he gets less and less cool and his role in each story becomes less and less prevalent. He isn't forced to do much detective work outside of the second movie, but that's more than enough to slot him as a competent and skilled Batman. However, this is only if I ignore the third movie. He's kind of fucking stupid in that one. His original plan to go stop Bane in the first half of the film is to just find him, and punch him. And worst of all, he completely places his trust in every woman he meets, despite the fact that all of them betray him multiple times. He gets duped and tricked and beaten so many times in just one film. It's really not a flattering look for him. And I'm also mad that this is the one Bruce Wayne who probably lacks the obsessive discipline the most out of every other Batman. This guy quits being Batman twice in one movie and it's never for a good reason. Next, let's move on to his toys. And this one's a little personal, but I don't really think his tech is very cool. I don't like his stupid little bat shurikens, okay? I like normal batarangs. I think his suit also doesn't look very cool. If the Keaton suit is too much form over function, I think this is too much function over form. It does get massive points for eventually becoming a suit that can turn its head, but if I'm gonna offer one hot take for this video, I think that I kind of visually like the suit better in Batman Begins. It gives Bale a thicker physique, and honestly, it doesn't even look like Christian Bale under there. And yeah, he can't move his neck in the suit, but the film actually works around it. You never see him bobbing around like Eric Cartman. And I really just like when Batman's a little bit thicker. Yeah, that's right. I'll admit it. I like BBWs. Big Bruce Wayne's. But the one thing I hate most about his gear is his fucking Batmobile. It looks so stupid. This looks like a vehicle that could be attributed to anybody. It doesn't scream Batman to me at all. Like fucking Master Chief would drive this. It's also so impractical. How the fuck does he drive around Chicago in this thing? It just wouldn't work. I do not like tank Batmobiles. This channel is not a safe space for fat Batmobiles. And mainly I think this Batman relies way too much on tech, which is something I never thought I'd say about Batman. It kind of feels like a lot of the time he relies a little bit too much on Lucius Fox to solve his problems. I don't like the fact that if Lucius Fox didn't exist in this universe, then Batman also wouldn't exist. Across this trilogy, he's more likely to use expensive gadgets than rely on his own brain and skills. He doesn't really feel like the world's greatest detective. You see, lately I've had a very simple method of determining if I think a character in a movie or show is smart, I call it the Kira method. It was inspired by this post. Basically, if the character is smart enough to catch Kira from Death Note, I consider them the smartest person in that story. Normally, Batman definitely can catch Kira, but this version of Batman probably can't. It makes sense to me, I don't know what else to say. Also, I think Christian Bale's Batman voice is stupid. I doubt many people get the better of you. Say again? I doubt many people get the better of you. What's that? I doubt many people get the better of you. There's a reason that this voice has been made fun of for so many years. There are some scenes where it really sounds fucking hilarious. This city just showed you that it's full of people ready to believe in good. Batman should sound imposing, yes, but there are so many times when Bruce does not need to be talking like this. Where is it? Uh, I never give it to an ordinary citizen. Where is it? Where's the trigger? Like in his final scene, he's basically telling Gordon that he's Bruce Wayne, but he's still using the stupid monster voice. And what's crazy to me is that it didn't always sound like this. I only realized this by watching these movies back to back, but Batman sounded a lot more normal in Batman Begins. What are they? The antidote. One for Gordon to inoculate himself, the other for mass production. When he's talking to his allies, he turns the growl off, but when he needs to scare a guy or seem imposing, he actually seems kind of cool. And then for some reason, Christian Bell just cranked it to 11 in the sequels. If you're working alone, wear a mask. 
dude, he knows you're Bruce Wayne. You don't need to be doing all this. But of course, we have the most important aspect of Batman, the no kill rule. And thankfully, Bale's Batman adheres to this rule very well. He stumbles a bit early on, but eventually he learns that everybody deserves a second chance. He refuses to lower himself to the level of the criminals he faces, and he fights to protect life no matter what he just killed Ra's al Ghul. And Two-Face. And Talia. And this bus driver? What the fuck? Okay, you could say that most of these are indirect kills, but I'm counting them, all right? If he's shooting a missile at a truck and it causes people in the truck to die, that's killing them. That kills people, Christopher. Hell, Joker's more dangerous than most of these people, and he saves his life. It's almost weird that he kills every other villain except for the Joker. I won't kill you. But I don't have to save you. Yes, you do! It's your fucking job! Really, everything about Bale's Batman can be summed up in the same way. He starts off very accurate and solid, but bits of him get stripped away or eroded by Nolan's desire to write his little crime thriller. He loses his swag, he loses his aura of coolness, hell, he even loses his butler. It's very clear that as the series went on, Nolan had his vision of what he wanted Batman to look like, and it clashes with what I like from my Batman. So, Bale's Batman definitely started off as a B, but over the course of the trilogy, I'd say he levels out to a C. So as a full package, I do still think the Nolan trilogy is solid. I have my problems with it, but they're not large enough to discredit the whole trilogy. But I still feel like we haven't found a Batman that I really love. But before we get to the last live action Batman movie, we have to explore the realm of animation. I said we're only doing movies that came out in theaters, but there are a few theatrical animated Batman films that we have to cover. So we're going old school with this one. We're gonna knock these out with a lightning round, starting with... That's right, I didn't forget about it. A lot of you asked in the comments of the last video if I was gonna cover this one, and of course I am. For the sole reason that I need a movie with an actual good Batman to show you guys what one looks like. I am taking this film as an excuse to praise Kevin Conroy's Batman. Like yeah, the movie's pretty good, but I don't really count it as a movie. Sorry, but I'm not sorry. It's barely over an hour long, so it really feels like one of the animated series two-parters. And while this film is good, I think the DC animated universe has pumped out better stories. Sorry, but it's true, there's just a lot of hits in that universe. I will praise the concept and character of the Phantasm though. You guys may have noticed that I kind of have an aversion to characters that are original to a movie. Rachel, Shrek, etc. That's really only because they're rarely as good as characters from the source material, but that's not the case here. Like yeah, go figure, the guy who invented Harley frickin' Quinn can make a good original character. This movie also effectively gives us Batman Begins before Batman began. It covers the year one era, where Bruce is still a bit of a rookie, and it's presented here very well, and in some cases, it's better than Batman Begins. In particular, I love Alfred's reaction to seeing Bruce as Batman for the first time. That's really cool. That's something I wish Batman Begins took inspiration on. Really, what I love most about this film is something that's not exclusive to it. It's the art style. The Bruce Timm style is perfect for Batman. It's perfect for animation in general. These designs streamline iconic characters down to their most important and most striking qualities. I love the fact that this simple image here is so evocative of Batman with just a few basic shapes and very little detail. We're currently in an era where every superhero feels like they're over-designed, so seeing superheroes that look like this just makes my brain happy. Everything about the visuals in this film are perfect, from the art direction to the at times very impressive animation. But like weirdly enough, this movie just never feels like it really stretches the budget very far. Like I've seen better animation in episodes of the TV show. But what I appreciate most about this movie and the show as a whole is how cozy it is. It isn't afraid to take its time and immerse us in the atmosphere. And one of my favorite parts of the narrative is in seeing young Bruce's conflict. See, this movie features a Batman romance that I think is done pretty well because it comes back around to his obsession with his duty. This is the first on-screen Batman who hesitates to find love because it clashes with his duty as Batman. I don't want to let you down, honest, but, but it just doesn't hurt so bad anymore. You can understand that, can't you? This is a great conflict for Bruce to have, and I think it's such a refreshing take on the Batman romance subplot. So yeah, this movie's stylish, it's nostalgic, it gets the job done. I like it just fine. 7.5 out of 10. I want to talk about Kevin Conroy now. This is what I've personally been waiting for. I have been wanting to talk about what the perfect Batman looks like. Because spoiler alert, 
this is him. He aces every one of the arbitrary categories I made. His Bruce Wayne is exactly the Bruce I think of when I think of the character. A confident, stylish, and complex man who keeps all of his depth hidden only for the audience to see. A guy who can put on an act when needed and isn't afraid to be a little sarcastic, a little sassy. His Batman is a perfect parallel, but at the same time, you can clearly see that they are the same person. He's always the most skilled individual in the room. If he gets caught by a bad guy, he usually frees himself. No mystery goes unsolved, even if the solution is as simple as drawing lips on pictures of the Joker. <laughs> okay, this one's a little stupid. He's not only the best fighter, but he's also the smartest guy in his own show almost every single time. This guy could definitely catch Kira. Hell, there's episodes where he's barely in the show, and his impact is even greater because of it. His gear is streamlined and iconic, the designs of his suit and tools are just as sleek as you come to expect from Bruce Timm. His Batmobile is one of my favorites. It has a nice, slim, art deco design that screams Batman without being too much. And most importantly, his voice is perfect. The reason I even made the Batman voice one of my stupid rules is because of Kevin Conroy. Because the thing that truly elevates this Batman is the performance. He doesn't need to do a stupid growling goblin voice to scare criminals. His Bruce and his Batman sound so distinct, but with the subtlest changes in the performance. This is how the character should sound. Chill and calm as Bruce Wayne. Thanks for the handkerchief, Arthur. You know where you can stick it. But then dark and intense as Batman. Why did the Joker meet with you? This is the perfect Batman. He is the template. And if you disagree, I'm scuffing your shoes. I'm giving Kevin Conroy's Batman the highest tier. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! Lightning round! Lego Batman is a movie that I've talked about a few times. Sorry, what? There's another animated Batman theatrical release? Oh God, no! Based on the comic of the same name, The Killing Joke had a limited release in theaters, meaning it is technically part of the video. I hate this. I have avoided watching this movie for a long time, and it has finally caught up to me. Written by Brian Azzarello, the man who gave us Batman's uncensored bat dick in comic form, The Killing Joke is basically just like the comic it's based on. Except now it's bad. You see, The Killing Joke isn't really a very long story, so to stretch it out to feature length, we have to add a lot of extra bullshit. DC likes to put out animated versions of their comics after the success of Under the Red Hood, an animated comic adaptation that I think is actually really good. And it's actually not a bad idea to make animated versions of comics because people don't like to read. But the problem is when things simply don't translate well from page to screen. And this is definitely apparent with The Killing Joke. This movie is padded out extensively by Azzarello OC. And it's all bad, it's just awful. It's the reason I avoided this movie for so long. You see, The Killing Joke is basically the Joker origin story and the Barbara Gordon Oracle origin story bundled into one. And unfortunately, this movie basically reduces Barbara down to just her sexuality. What can I tell you? Batgirl's hot. Every character she interacts with treats her like a sex doll. Now, this would be bad enough as it is, but this also includes Batman. Yeah, in this movie, Batman has a sexual relationship with Batgirl. Whoa, 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 hey, 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 hey. And it's just as bad as you expect it to be. If I didn't already know about this, I don't know how I would have reacted if I saw this in theaters. Like, if I walked into this raw, I guarantee I probably would have walked out of the theater. And I knew this shit was bad, but watching it now, it's somehow worse than I expected. I don't even know why they spent so much time on Batgirl in this. Like, her having sex with Bruce has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. I'm not joking. For the first half, it's all about Barbara wanting to fuck Batman, and then it immediately shifts to just the regular adaptation of The Killing Joke and it never mentions the sex ever again. I legitimately have no idea why this was added to the story. The Joker's plot in this story is to drag Gordon down to his level by mentally torturing him. But Gordon has like no screen time. We spent so much time on Barbara, and by the time she gets shot, she doesn't matter anymore. And I'm aware that most of the time, my hatred of romance in Batman stories is a very personal thing. 
and I can look past it if the story is good enough. I've already shown that. But this, this is too much for me, okay? I'm tapping out. The first half of this movie is just a dog shit mob plot line where Batgirl gets objectified in every scene. And her only character trait is that she wants to have sex with Batman. That's it, that's all she cares about. For the first half, I forgot this was supposed to be a Joker movie. And it's hilarious that Barbara's reward for enduring all of this shit is getting shot in the spine by Joker, stripped naked, and tortured. You see, that was a bit more acceptable in the context of the original story, but here, it is so much worse. You ruined everything! Must be that time of the month. Oh my god. Do not watch this movie. It sucks. Read the comic. Zero out of ten. Worst superhero movie tier list. This Batman gets the lowest tier. I am so sorry they made you be in this movie, Kevin. Lightning round! All right, so that was a sack of shit and a half, but now it's time to quickly run through a Batman movie that's a breath of fresh air. Lego Batman. This movie was definitely a big surprise for people when it came out, and I've praised this movie many times in the past, to the point where I considered skipping it for this video. For a while, I did call this the best Batman movie, and while it has been unseated, I do still rank this as one of my favorites. Much like the Adam West era, this is a comedic and lighthearted take on the character, and while it is a very, very funny movie, my favorite thing about it is that it actually offers a good character arc for Batman, which is something that we don't see very often. This narrative feels like a direct rebuttal to the era of dark, edgy Snyderverse Batman that was prevalent at the time. This story features a Batman who is so far gone and so self-destructive that he has nobody in his life other than Alfred. And the plot revolves around him accepting other people into his life. This movie truly understands that Batman isn't just the brooding edgelord and that the Bat family is an important aspect of the character that nearly every film has elected to ignore. It really is weird that Robin and Batgirl are so important to the character of Batman, but movies just don't like using them. And Michael Cera's performance as Robin stands out in this movie. His peppy attitude mixed with Will Arnett's Batman makes for a great comedic duo. And yeah, this is probably the best version of the dynamic duo that we've ever seen in a movie. My name's Richard Grayson, but all the kids at the orphanage call me Dick. Well, children can be cruel. Yeah. <laughs> However, I do have some minor critiques of this movie. Firstly, this film relies slightly on context from the original Lego movie. To the point where I'd say this is like the second movie in the larger Lego movie trilogy. And I do kind of wish this one stood alone just a bit more and it could be its own thing. And I think this movie's at its worst when it acts like a Ready Player One theme park full of characters from other properties. Like, I don't think Sauron and King Kong really fit in this story. There's enough Batman and overall DC content to fill a movie. You can just use that stuff. Secondly, Batman is in love with Batgirl again in this movie. I don't know how or why this trend started, but I don't like it. They do age her up a little bit more here, and Batman is basically a frat boy, so it's not nearly as bad. But I am just naturally inclined to hate this plot point in any story it's a part of now. But other than those minor gripes, I do like this movie a lot. It really feels like a love letter to the Batman franchise, with every movie being referenced at least once, every aspect of the comics are put into consideration, everything Batman related is used, and it's used with love. I also think the Lego movies in general are super underrated when it comes to the visuals. The style of CG enhanced stop motion looks amazing. The fact that every single object on screen is a Lego is a level of detail that honestly scares me. And I love that you can see the plastic molding on the models. It gives it a tactile element that helps with the illusion. There's just so much whimsy here, and watching it again kind of made me sad that we don't get more Lego movies anymore. Oh, and the movie's also fucking hilarious. Commissioner Gordon, you gotta take a look at this. What's that? A monkey and dog are friends. Not much else to say about this one. It reignited a wave of comedic Batman stories, and I think that's a very important aspect of the character. So I'm gonna give Lego Batman an eight out of 10, and Lego Batman himself is basically on the same level as Adam West Batman. He's wacky, silly, goofy, and he doesn't really fit into the criteria that we set for other Batman. But weirdly enough, despite the fact that he basically is Batman's negative traits manifested into a person, he is still a pretty accurate Batman. Plus, he doesn't kill anybody, so Lego Batman's going in the beat here. But now, with all that out of the way, it's finally time to end this video.
This is the one. It took a dozen movies, but we finally made it. We finally have an accurate Batman movie. Now, I've already done a quickie on this one, but I've still been looking forward to talking about how much I love the Batman. Everything I've asked for in a Batman movie is here. It's shot incredibly well, and I love when the camera barely gives us a hint of what's happening. The film loves to keep information out of focus, especially during Riddler's scenes. This makes these scenes even more uncomfortable and eerie. Extreme close-ups of abstract imagery give us the feeling of an environment without showing all of it to us. There is no Batman movie that looks better than this. This film is great at giving us the suggestion of events happening without the need to show us everything. Our imaginations can fill in the blanks and it provides for such thick and palpable atmosphere. And this dark, muddy visual language is perfect for the character of Batman. I've already explained at length what it looks like when a movie doesn't have the sauce. So when I say that this movie has the fucking sauce, you can see why. The opening scene with Batman is probably my favorite Batman movie scene of all time. I talk about the first scene of movies a lot with these superhero retrospectives, and this scene helps explain why. A good intro has the power to immediately immerse the viewer, and I think that's very important. In this scene, we see that Gotham is disgusting, which I've said is crucial. Don't tell me that Gotham sucks. Show me. This is the kind of city you only live in if the rent is $12 a month. And we've seen many times now that most Batman films like to start this way. A dark, steamy night filled with crime when Batman shows up and punches people. Yippee! But I love how this film twists it slightly. This Batman's been around for a while, and we don't know anything about him. So this intro needs to tell us everything in a concise and compelling way. The writing in this intro is so evocative of Batman comics and recontextualizing this narration as Bruce's journal makes sense in the context of this film. I said it the last time I reviewed this movie, but when this narration started, I thought to myself, oh yeah, this movie gets it. This monologue feels like it's straight off the pages of a comic. The narration gives vibes of a Fincher film being over dramatic and wordy, and that's exactly what a Batman narration should be. Each line is so unquestionably Batman. Two years of nights have turned me into a nocturnal animal. That's called motherfucking bars, nigga! Fucking you know nothing about that! However, the most important aspect of this intro is that it shows us something no other Batman film has really been able to capture. Batman is terrifying. We can finally see Batman's impact before we see him on screen. The intro is so good at conveying everything we need to know. This isn't a Batman that's focused on being a paragon of hope and justice. This dude is pissed. And you can hear this in his theme song, which is one of the best Batman themes of all time at this point. Like, listen to how part of it sounds distinctly unheroic. It sounds like music from a horror movie. It sounds like it's building up to a jump scare. Like I said, this all works very well to immerse us in this version of Gotham, to the point where it feels like a splash of cold water when we finally move on to a scene in the daytime. This noir intro sets up a film that's okay with taking its time. I was actually surprised to see that this is the longest Batman movie, though I know a lot of people think it's a little too long. And I can see that perspective, but I simply enjoy spending more time in this world. I wouldn't call it a masterpiece of pacing and tension like The Dark Knight, but it's not trying to be that. It's not trying to be a crime thriller, it's trying to be a murder mystery. I enjoy that it doesn't move at a breakneck pace. It feels like a mystery that takes Batman and his pals a while to unravel. And it gives us more time to learn about this version of the Gotham characters that we already may know. Gordon here is a lot less confident than any other version of the character, which works here because it makes sense that he would rely on Batman to help him with cases that he can't solve with his perspective alone. I also really like that him and Batman feel like friends here. They feel like college roommates. Zoe Kravitz serves as the only on-screen Catwoman that I've actually been emotionally invested in. I like that her chemistry with Batman is actually believable and that she has a stake in the plot to keep things fresh. I also like that her and Bruce are interacting for most of the film so the slow burn romance gets to build naturally. She also seems to genuinely care about him, which is not common among the Catwomen that we've seen in these movies. Overall, I'm happy to say this is one of the few acceptable Batman romances. Paul Dano is one of the best actors of the modern era, and it's fun to see him just do whatever the hell he wants. He also succeeds at being the first person to make the Riddler terrifying. And I also like that he's an internet nut job. It's very fitting. 
John Turturro is severely underrated as Carmine Falcone. Falcone. Oh hey, they said his name right this time. I like when an actor like this gets to put on a villainous performance. Maybe this is just because I'm used to seeing him in those fucking Transformers movies. Bumblebee, stop lubricating the man. And of course, while we're on the topic of the best actors of the modern era, Colin Farrell is absolutely insane as the Penguin. Like, there's a lot of people that still don't know this was Colin Farrell. That's how good he is. All of these characters are so full of life and they add a lot of texture to this version of Gotham. One minor complaint I have about the Nolan trilogy that I haven't brought up yet is that at times the characters kind of just boil down to Batman, the bad guys, and then everybody else. Most of the side characters have the same desires, the same outlook on life, the same narrative goals. So sometimes they can just feel very samey, but that's not the case here. And it makes for a more interesting Gotham. Strangely enough, I also really like how funny this movie is. Yeah, a lot of dum-dums complained when this movie came out saying, it's not funny enough. And I don't know what fucking movie they watch because this shit is hilarious. Maybe we can talk about what they did to my partner's face. Holy God, what are you this showing me? His head. Come on! Open your eyes! The humor is a lot darker and more morbid to fit with the overall tone, and I think it helps to give small moments of levity in an otherwise pretty dark story. You have the identical twin goons that keep getting tricked by Batman, Riddler's YouTube influencer video, and there's also the bit about how everybody who hates Batman is a huge Bruce Wayne fanboy. This movie is not at all embarrassed to be a comic book movie. It's not embarrassed to be goofy sometimes. It may be dark, but it's also okay with utilizing schlocky aspects of the Batman world that still feel appropriately comic booky. And this helps because when the lines are corny, it fits the tone. Some drive. Though I will say that my least favorite part of the whole movie is the Joker tease at the end it still feels very forced and out of place. It's the one thing about the movie that I really wish was done differently. But truly, the greatest thing that this movie does accomplish is that it gives Batman a really good character arc. Yeah, I can count on one hand how many of these movies have given Batman a character arc, and spoilers, it's the ones I like the most. The point of this narrative is to show us a Batman who starts off being fueled by rage, a Batman who clearly has the right intentions, but is so driven by vengeance that he doesn't come across as the hero he needs to be. The first person we see him save is just as afraid of him as the gang members are. Alfred is visibly disappointed in Bruce's approach. Bruce doesn't take care of himself. He looks like he's about to fall over whenever we see him during the day. But this narrative is focused on Bruce learning what it means to be more than a symbol of vengeance. It's about him learning how to be a superhero. The film ends with him literally serving as a guiding light for the civilians of Gotham. This shot not only looks great, but it serves so much narrative significance. But my favorite part of all of this is at the end, when that civilian is holding on to Batman for dear life. The first citizen we saw Batman interact with was scared shitless of him, and the last one we see him interact with has trusted him with their life. This is the most important part of the entire character of Batman. The part of the character that so many writers and filmmakers ignore. Batman is not just an edgelord who wants to punch people. His primary goal, his driving motivation, is to make sure that nobody has to experience the night he experienced as a child. The reason he doesn't kill is because that night he learned that life is precious and he will do anything to protect it. And finally, we get a movie that understands that. This is why I can say without a doubt that this is the best Batman movie. It understands the character so well and it helps that it's a pretty good movie on top of that. So I'm gonna give The Batman a 9.5 out of 10. Now it's time for our final Bat ranking. How does Battinson stack up to his peers? To start with his gear, I gotta say, I think his suit is really cool. The scrap together design looks like a cowboy or a bounty hunter, and it's a vibe that's clearly intentional when you see the suit framed in shots like this. The collar is a nice touch, which gives him a unique silhouette over other Batman. His gadgets are also surprisingly unique. Most notably, his contact lens camera things are something that are so creative and fitting for the character. And I really like that when you look at him, you can tell that every part of the suit serves a purpose. Even the logo is a fucking pocket knife. But I really love that his Batmobile is just a really cool car. 
And it is as evil as a car can look. It's very evocative of the animated series Batmobile, and it definitely suits this version of the character. I'm also happy to say that this is really just probably the coolest Batman. He's probably the Batman with the fewest lines, but I think that makes him cooler. And it really accentuates the few words that he does share. I love the opening detective scene where he barely says anything. And whenever he notices a detail in the crime scene that the other detectives missed, we just see him silently look at it and move on. When I saw that for the first time, I said out loud, holy shit, that's so fucking cool. This Batman does a lot to show us how badass he is in just his screen presence. His aura is so strong that his footsteps count as part of his dialogue. His most imposing and kick-ass scenes include the introduction of his Batmobile, which is a scene I am very thankful to have experience in a theater, and of course the short hallway fight later in the movie. It's funny how The Dark Knight Rises tried to do something like this too, and it comes across as kind of goofy, but here it, it's perfect. Again, like I said before, the movie is at its best when it's not showing us what's happening. And I love how this Batman just doesn't care if he gets hurt. He tanks so much damage and it shows how little value he places on his own life. Again, all of this tells us so much about him without him having to say anything. We see it all in his actions. And when he finally does say something, it somehow makes him cooler. Never get in there without a warrant. Yeah. He's so fucking sick. He has the coolest fight scenes, he solves the most mysteries, he does eat shit at least once, but I said that newbie Batman get to mess up at least once, so he gets a pass. However, while I think his Batman is possibly our best live action on screen Batman, I can't really say the same for his Bruce Wayne. Now I'm not saying I don't like edgy Kurt Cobain Bruce Wayne, I think it's a fresh and unique take on the character, and as I always say, Changing a character is good when it's in service of a good story. And that's definitely the case here. But my problem is that we don't get a good picture of what his Bruce Wayne is gonna be like now that he's had his character arc. I can tell that this really is the beginning of his growth as a character. And I'm gonna have to see how he looks in the next movie to really judge if he's a good Bruce Wayne or not. Because we don't really get to see the Bruce Wayne persona very often. This is the one Batman story where the line between Bruce and the Bat is the most blurred. Now this is of course something I think could change in the sequel, so I'm excited to see how he develops further, but for now, I can't rank his Bruce as highly as others. But I will say of course, that with a Batman as accurate as this one, it is no surprise that he finally does not kill anybody. Really, it's shocking that out of all of the live action movies, almost all of the Batmen kill somebody, except for the best one and the worst one. So I'm gonna go ahead and place Battenson in the A tier. And that's it. That's every single on-screen Batman and the films that they're in. I think it's a pretty good list. I'm happy with it. For the most part. You see, I can't help but feel like something's missing. All right, fuck it. Let's rank Ben Affleck's Batman. Now I meant it when I said I'm not reviewing Joss Whedon's Justice League, for the sole reason that my rules specified that Batman has to be the main character for the movie to count. Batman just doesn't do enough in Justice League. I don't have that much Batman content to talk about in that movie. But still, I think it's only fair that we end this video by ranking the one Batman I've spent my entire YouTube career talking about. Now I have reviewed and rated Batman v Superman, where I can say that Batman is definitely one of the main characters. So if you haven't seen that, go watch it so that we can rank Ben Affleck on the same rule set as the other Batmans. Firstly, his gear. Now, I actually think he looks kind of cool. I hate to say it, but visually, Batfleck is probably the best looking on-screen Batman. Never say I don't give credit where it's due. I like the short ears, the chunky logo, the fact that the suit is actually gray, and just the absolute size of this unit. This is a BBW if I've ever seen it. As for the rest of his gear, it's mostly your standard Batman fare, except it's much more lethal. His vehicles have weaponry that could kill the Hulk. He carries around a Batman logo that he uses to burn his symbol onto people so they can be murdered in prison. So uh, yeah, he looks good, but uh, I don't really like when Batman has such violent technology. As for his skills, I think he's definitely one of the dumber Batman. He is fully clouded by rage in Batman v Superman, and I can't call someone smart 
if all it takes to stop him from killing Superman is the fact that their moms have the same name. I am never going to let that go. And really the fact that he's so easily manipulated by Lex Luthor is enough for me to rank him pretty low on intelligence and competence. He's a dumb meathead who punches first and asks questions later. He completely lacks all critical thinking in that movie. Hell, if we're just talking about his competence, in both Batman v Superman and Justice League, he has nothing to do in the last battle of both movies. You can't find any way to help? Why are you even here? What do you even do? However, when it comes to his fights, I gotta give him credit again. He does have the coolest fight any on-screen Batman has ever gotten. Even if he is fucking killing people, I still gotta give Zack credit here. It's a really well-directed fight scene. Also, this is a personal one, but I really don't like his Batman voice. I hate that he relies on a voice modulator to make himself sound scarier. It's stupid, and at that point, I'd rather you just do a stupid Christian Bale monster voice. At least he was trying. Now, with all that said, how would I rank his Bruce Wayne? Well, he's actually not that bad. Yeah, I'm not joking, I think he's fine. Firstly, it helps that I think Ben Affleck physically is exactly what I picture when I imagine Bruce. And for what it's worth, his performance in BVS is not really that bad. He does sleepwalk his way through the rest of the series, but still, this is exactly what I think Bruce should look and act like. And when he's not in costume, he's actually a lot more chill. He's not like a violent, murderous freak anymore. And strangely enough, I think his best representation of Bruce comes from the Flash movie. I'm serious. Mainly that one scene where him and Barry are talking next to the car. Like this one scene is actually my ideal vision for how I want a seasoned older Bruce to act. Yeah, I bet you didn't expect me to compliment Batfleck this much. I'm as surprised as you are. However, all of this is ruined by the fact that he fucking kills people. Hell, to make it worse, he kills people with guns. I thought Keaton killed a lot of people, but Affleck really has him beat. He's putting up Michael Jordan numbers. And the fact that he uses guns is just a hard line that I cannot accept for any Batman. If Darkseid isn't about to destroy the universe, Bruce better keep that fucking thing in the holster. I'm more strict about the fucking gun rule than the killing rule, if we're being honest. I am so against Batman using guns that I mean it with 100% sincerity that Bruce isn't even allowed to use guns in his dream sequences. This should be a man who has such a strong aversion to firearms that even his subconscious should resist the thought of them. And with the Snyder Cut, we now know that these scenes of Wasteland Batman with the gun aren't even dream sequences. They're canon. And that's just unfucking acceptable It is a blatant misunderstanding of the character, and even though I think aspects of this Batman aren't that bad, I cannot overlook this. And it's really a shame, because I think with a great filmmaker, Batfleck really could have gotten a good movie. The potential really was there, but we just don't live in that world. So Batfleck is getting placed in the D tier. And that's it guys, all the Batmans. It was pretty fun, but now I'm tired. These videos took forever. You know, I do love Batman and his movies, but these were quite the roller coaster. I think this is the most tonal whiplash I've ever gotten from one series. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching, but I need some rest. Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year. And don't worry, I'll make a Joss Whedon Justice League video soon. I'm sorry, I can't help it. I have to talk about it. It's so bad.